Independent assortment was a lie. Genes can assort together if they want to. With that knowledge, let's move into mapping of chromosomes. We're defining locus, scent organ, genetic linkage, haplotype, crossing over, linkage equilibrium and linkage disequilibrium, and relating genetic linkage to crossing over. This is going to be a lecture much more on things that you may have learned in genetics. Good job. Uh, Bio 141? Probably not or in some other courses, but this is going to set the groundwork necessary to really understand why sexual selection is so important and why recombination is so essential. Let's move in. So, genetic linkage. We are going to be looking at some genes that are together on the same chromosome. We have here a gene for a tall allele for pea plants. There's an allele for the tall and allele for the short. And what we see is that these are going to have different alleles on homologous chromosomes. This should sound familiar. If not, I want to go back to your 141 stuff and just check it out. The genotype here is T, little big T, little T. It's a heterozygote for the tall allele. Now, these are supposed to be one gene on one chromosome is what we have been tracking. What we've assumed is the law of independent assortment. That each pair of alleles segregates independently of other pairs of alleles so that those tall genes are going, to are going to sort independently of purple flowers and white flowers. That you can get two different combinations of traits, tall plants with white flowers, tall plants with purple flowers, or short plants with white or purple flowers. These combinations should be independent, depending on how the homologs align in metaphase one. The law of independent assortment is basically going to state that two traits are independent. Independent, okay, all women who independent, there we go, independent assortment. Here we have, again, one of the pea plants. We've got colored peas. They're either green, which is recessive, or yellow, which is dominant, or they are round, which is dominant, or wrinkled, which is recessive. And we would assume, under general conditions, that you get a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio if you perform a dihybrid cross on these. Good. And that 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 means that they are indeed assorting independently and they are indeed following the laws of dominance. Cool, great, Mendelian, but it's not always true. So here we have again how that's going to set out. Let's say that the tall, uh, that the um, green allele, the green or yellow allele was on that small chromosome and the um, round or wrinkled allele was on the big chromosome. So you see how they can assort independently. So you have four different combinations, which you see in that nine to three to three to one ratio, as those would work out in the, um, oh shoot, there are four, four combinations of alleles, four combinations of possibilities. You can see those four on the top row and the four on the bottom, the crossbars there. Those are the four different combinations you can get, creating a total of 16 combinations when you, you know, put them all together. All right, so that's your independent assortment of two genes that are most certainly unlinked, but that's not true. Linkage is going to violate this. Genetic linkage is that there are more genes than there are chromosomes, and therefore there are going to be genes, some genes that are going to travel together more often than not. Genes that link to loci are going to sort together during metaphase one. So here we have the uh, vestigial wings and the normal wings. That's one gene. And we have the black body and the normal body. That's a different gene. So we have a female here who is heterozygous, heterozygous and a male here who has both of the recessive traits. So this is what's called a test cross when you take an IG, um, a parent of unknown, if it is it heterozygous or is it homozygous, and you toss ah, Cross it with something that is entirely homozygous recessive. So you can see that there's only one type of gamete that can be given by the double recessive. There are four types of gametes that can be given by the wild type here, where it is heterozygous. And there are four different combinations here <clears throat> in the end. So what we see though is that they're unlike with independent assortment where those four different types of alleles came from four different assortments of chromosomes, here we have recombination giving rise to two of those types, where there has been a chiasmata, a chiasma between the homologs in prophase one, which separates those two alleles, creating recombinant genotypes. 
So that is how genes are linked. Now this does violate independent assortment because only when those uh, recombination occurs will you see the recombinant genotypes. Much more often, you're only going to see those two parental genotypes. So unless there is recombination, then that wild type can only make two types of alleles for these two linked genes, or two types of uh, gametes for these two linked genes. So that is where they, that's where this kind of, you know, is different than independent assortment. And how far apart are these? Well, well first off, it's crossing over is that thing that's going to do that. So crossing over. And how often does crossing over occur? Well, if you have two different chromosomes, they're going to sort independently. If you've got two alleles that are very far away from each other on different ends of the chromosome, then those two alleles at the different ends of the chromosome are usually going to sort independently of one another because it just means somewhere on that whole chromosome, they have, um, they've got crossing over somewhere on the entire chromosome, anywhere on the entire chromosome. Top arm, bottom arm, right in the middle, doesn't matter. Somewhere in the entire chromosome there is a crossing over event. So that's going to be um, that's going to be far enough away to sort independently. But if they're right next to each other, they seldom sort independently. So how do we measure how far away they are? That's called centimorgans. And this is a genetic map of Drosophila chromosomes. Let's say you took a hundred of these a hundred gametes from a fruit fly. And you're looking at, let's see, I'm going to put um, these, let's see, up here on chromosome 1, you've got that yellow body and the white eyes. So the yellow body and the white eyes. Yellow body is at mark 0, and white eyes is at mark 1.5. What this means is if you took 100 gametes, then 1 or 2, somewhere between 1 or 2, usually on average about 1.5 of those gametes would have a crossover event between yellow body and white type, or white eyes. So this is where... The farther, are they, uh, farther away they are apart, the more, cross, more times you're going to see crossing over events occur there. So really it's a probability of a crossover event between two alleles, between two genes, two loci, really, between two loci, that's the right way to say it. So the probability of a crossover event between two loci is measured in centimorgans, because there's, you know, up to a hundred, so that's one morgan is a hundred of them. Okay. Um, this is where I stop in class and take questions and say I'm going to take, I'm going to hope that you took questions and wrote them into the forum because that is how far apart we measure loci. All right, moving on to linkage disequilibrium. <clears throat> linkage disequilibrium is a measurement of how often genes are going to travel together and how often they're not going to based on recombination. So we're looking at Hardy-Weinberg, really, for two genes. And this is where you have two linked alleles on a single chromosome. So these two alleles are on a single chromosome, and they sort together. They do not sort independently. Instead of calculating the frequency of A and the frequency of little a, and the frequency of B and the frequency of little b, we are here able to calculate the frequency of the four possible combinations of those two loci. Given that there are two alleles for each of two loci, you have four possible combinations. When we're looking at these, we're going to call this a haplotype. It's the multi-locus genotype on a chromosome, single chromosome, haploid, haplotype. <clears throat> so we're going to look at the haplotype here, which can be either capital A, capital B, capital A, lowercase b, b, you get the idea. That's your haplotype. So we're going to compare different haplotype, haplotypes to measure whether something is in equilibrium or disequilibrium. So, let's see. First, we're going to calculate the frequency of the dominant, of do, the two dominants being together. And we're going to calculate, the, that can, that is hopefully determined by the frequency of each dominant independently. So that's going to assume some sort of equilibrium, that the frequency of getting those together is just the frequency of each of them existing independently. If that's not true, then the two may be in linkage disequilibrium. So this is how we measure linkage disequilibrium. Do we see this as true? And what we're looking at here is um, the frequency of, let's say, um, this uppercase B, the dominant B allele. Um, what is that? I got that right there. 
in, among, so among all of the uppercase A should be equal to the frequency of the uh, uppercase one here among the lowercase a. <clears throat> Essentially, we have 12 out of 25 in this first population, 12 out of, oh, sorry, 12 out of 15 um, uppercase b's when there are uppercase a's, and 8 out of 10 uppercase b's when there are lowercase b's. So in both of these, it's an 8 tenths. So it's 8 tenths given both of these. That's linkage equilibrium. Linkage disequilibrium is when, because they're linked, you're going to have something else. So let's calculate this out as uh, C, dis so disequilibrium. What's going to happen there is we're calculating the frequency of that. So this is when we say um, D, the D being the disequilibrium. So D equals zero when the, uh, so D uh, equals the frequency of both homozygotes traveling together times both homozygotes traveling together minus the frequency of heterozygotes times heterozygotes. And d equals zero means that there is um, no, disequilib no disequilibrium. So what we're really measuring here with this equilibrium, disequilibrium, is are we seeing these two genes linked or not? And this is just a way of measuring it by looking from Hardy-Weinberg's perspective as opposed to genetic mapping perspective. So we're looking at populations here, not individuals. So we're not looking at whether an individual has a yellow body and vestigial wings. No, we're looking how frequently you see the yellow body with normal wings and how frequently you see the yellow body with vestigial wings. This helps us determine whether things are linked or not. And you can see if they were linked, that one of those is going to be much greater than the other. So it's going to cause a disequilibrium. Okay. That's tough to understand on the first thing. We're going to review it again in another lecture, and I'll be glad to review it um, as questions come forth. Check your book. They do a pretty good job. Uh, how much am I going to test on that? Well, how much am I going to test on that really depends on how well we all are understanding it. If none of us understand it whatsoever, it's just going to be some very simple questions. Like, what is it? Okay. Here's a better one. Why do why is it? So why do populations have disequilibrium? Well, there can be several different causes of, uh, of disequilibrium. And you see that linkage equilibrium and Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium are going to actually happen at the same time, these basal assumptions of the boring world. One is genetic drift. <clears throat> it could be that genetic drift has caused these two alleles to both occur in the population at a higher frequency together than they would independently. And that can be because genetic drift eliminates, uh, eliminates haplotypes. This can also be if migration, so combining different gene pools, can introduce new haplotypes. Um, both of these gene pools may be at link linkage equilibrium, but when you combine them, it's di linkage disequilibrium because now you have an uneven number of different haplotypes. And last and very importantly, selection on multi-locus genotypes. And we're coming back to this later. So multi-locus genotypes means that perhaps one gene is fine, uh, getting one allele is fine, getting it recessive, whatever, getting the other recessive, sure, okay, Getting both recessive at once, eh, game over. So that's possibility there, is that what you see here on this um, figure, is that zygotes produced from random mating, okay. However, all of those ones that were in that bottom corner didn't survive because a combination of alleles is lethal. So certain combinations of alleles can simply be lethal, causing natural selection to eliminate a certain haplotype, and that is a big time linkage disequilibrium. All right. Recombination eliminates this. 
over time, recombination and sexual selection is going to eliminate linkage disequilibrium, and random mating is going to restore linkage equilibrium, just like we're seeing this Hardy-Weinberg-like thing. It's the restoration of equilibrium given certain basic assumptions. Recombination between the genes is going to change the ratios of hap haplotypes, and the more recombination that occurs, the more the haplotypes are going to be different in a population, especially if the genes are farther away. So you can see here the, uh, the coefficient of linkage disequilibrium over a generation really just depends on the recombination rate. So after only um, five generations, given a recombination rate of 50%, that this linkage disequilibrium goes from 0.25 down to zero, effectively. So consider this, selection on multi-locus genotypes, however, might not be between linked genes, but could be between genes across two chromosomes. And this is kind of one of those interesting things that you can think about, and that can give you some genetic nightmares. All right, last up, genetic hitchhiking. This is where linkage disequilibrium is a result of a selective sweep. L503F is a mutation that enhances an individual's ability to take up ergothiamine. This is an antioxidant. Having this mutation has arisen in European populations, it looks like two or three times. I would guess two times because what you see here is two, maybe once. Okay, hear me out. <laughs> You've got that one, you got a very uh, high amount of it happening in uh, Sweden, you know, Sweden and Finland. And then you have it in the Mediterranean. Well, uh, do remember that during, um, during about 600 AD or so, a group of Normans from, um, from those northern most, lat most latitudes actually settled on Sicily. So I'm looking at the map and I'm looking at history and I'm thinking, well, it might have just been one time mutation or it could have been two times mutations. Either way, you see two epicenters. And you're going to tell me, well, what about Kiev? You know, you look at Ukraine, it's north of the Caspian Sea. And I would remind you that Vikings colonized Kiev repeatedly. So we know that that epicenter around Ukraine is probably due to um, Scandinavian descent. So that's that's almost certain here. You probably also see it in, in uh, in uh, Minneapolis or something, where there's a lot of Scandinavian blood. Anyway, so it could be a Scandinavian loan, or maybe it was happened on the Sicilian side, and they colonized Northern Africa as well. Either way, history aside, you see basically two, maybe three, epicenters of this. I'm counting Kiev as a third, it's not really. Anyway, this antioxidant is one mutation. Okay, cool. It was highly selected for in these populations at some point. So a selective sweep happened. There are two nearby genes, however, that encode immune factors and can cause Crohn's disease, which is a painful bowel, move, a painful bowel disease. So these nearby genes reduce fitness. L503F increased fitness, but it increased fitness enough that it was fixed in the population. And when it was fixed in the population, it happened to exist, this mutation existed in a haplotype with Crohn's. And because it existed, in a haplotype with Crohn's and got nearly fixed in this population, you see it's almost 50% of the population have this, then that's going to increase the likelihood of Crohn's disease existing in these populations. So that's called genetic hitchhiking. It's when a deleterious allele can get next to and linked to a highly beneficial allele. And when the beneficial allele is fixed, the haplotype that includes the deleterious allele also gets fixed quite against natural selection. Well, there's a little genetic linkage for you. Um, take some time, review it, and feel free to ask questions. We'll come back and review it just a little bit pretty quickly in the next lecture.